All right, so we've done nervous system, we've done sensory uh, nervous system, we got the input, the afferent fibers bringing um, that sensory information in. Now we're going to talk about the efferent pathways. Um, chiefly, we're going to be talking about the autonomic nervous system. Um, we'll touch base a little bit on the somatic, um, but chiefly we're going to be talking autonomic. Autonomic is that system that basically controls many of the unconscious things that we don't have to think about. Stuff like heart rate, uh, breathing, um, blood pressure control, all that stuff, all that housekeeping stuff that we don't have to consciously think about is controlled by the autonomic nervous system, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic, right? The muscles, our skeletal muscles, which are under our conscious control, is controlled by the somatic nervous system. But again, most of our focus on this lecture is going to be autonomic. We'll touch base on somatic and just look at kind of the differences between, between the two. But again, all that housekeeping stuff that's controlling all our housekeeping, the autonomic nervous system controls it, and that's what we'll be looking at. All right, so here's the setup of the nervous systems. We've already been over this way. Okay, we talked about the sensory system. Most of the sensory system we talked about was the sensory system that goes to our conscious thoughts. We didn't talk about the visceral senses, but the autonomic nervous system, the efferent neurons, and the autonomic neurons, they are usually in reflex with these visceral uh, sensory system, the ones that are going to look at blood pressure um, and so forth. So the autonomic neurons, again, they can be further broken down in the sympathetic and parasympathetic. Okay, and what are they going to control? They're going to control all those organs that we don't have to consciously think about. We don't have to think about how our heart's beating, so our cardiac muscle. We don't have to consciously move our digestive, contract our digestive system so we can move food material through, like our smooth muscles, and also our blood pressure or our blood vessel diameter, also controlled by our smooth vessel. We don't consciously think about that stuff exocrine gland, um, some endocrine, and also adipose tissue. So all those things we consciously don't have to be aware of or controlling, that is under the function of the autonomic nervous system. The somatic, again, we're only going to touch briefly on the somatic, but that controls the skeletal muscles. So it's conscious thought. We consciously, hey, I need to contract my muscles. And we have to consciously put thought into that. Those are controlled by the somatic motor neurons. Okay, but again, we're going to focus chiefly on the autonomic and the sympathetic and parasympathetic here. So what we're going to see with the autonomic nervous system, we got two divisions to it. We have the parasympathetic, also known as that rest and digest. Right, so when you're sitting around meditating, um, um, you're listening to parasympathetic, right? This would be your professor because I'm definitely afraid of snakes. If I saw a snake running after me, um, luckily they usually don't run after you, but if you did, if they did, you would be mobilizing your sympathetic, your fight or flight. All right, I need to get out of here. Boom. Okay, or fight, whatever's off. That's the sympathetic. And usually, they're working and they're working in opposition. There's usually a balance depending on what's taking place, what you're doing, depends on which system is the dominant system. All right, like running, doing exercise, the sympathetic is going to become dominant. When you're sitting around just watching TV, eating some potato chips, the parasympathetic is going to be dominant. So there's a balance between these two. All right, fight or flight and rest and digest. Okay, and so basically the parasympathetic usually going to stimulate organs that the sympathetic doesn't stimulate. The sympathetic would actually inhibit those organs. And when the sympathetic would activate organs that the parasympathetic would 
be inhibitory to. So they again, they're in opposition or antagonistic against each other. So let's look at the basic pathway for the autonomic nervous system. Okay, the autonomic nervous systems are going to originate through the spinal cord or the lower parts of the brain. And from there, it is going to take two neurons because what are we doing? We're controlling these organs. We're efferent. We're going efferent pathways from the central nervous system out to whatever target tissue we're trying to get a response at. Okay, and it's a two neuron pathway in series that's going to get us out to that target niche tissue from the central nervous system out to the target tissue. And so the two neurons, they're labeled preganglionic and postganglionic. And this is because these two neurons are going to synapse in an autonomic ganglion. If you remember ganglions, our nerve fibers are our axons. Okay, what part is the ganglions made of? Outside of the central nervous system, ganglions, a cluster of cell bodies, makes up your ganglion. Okay, and that is where we're going to synapse. In these autonomic ganglions, the preganglionic is going to synapse with the postganglionic. Okay, that is for both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic pathway. We're going to see there are differences in this pre and post ganglionic neurons and the neurotransmitters in them, but they both have a pre and a post ganglionic neuron that gets us out to the target tissue. All right, this is the common type. There are some special circumstances which we'll look at, but typically there are pre ganglionic and post ganglionic neurons. Divergence. Divergence would come with our sympathetic. Many of our, or not many, but some of our sympathetic fibers will actually have collaterals that go out that diverge, and this one preganglionic neuron can actually synapse multiple postganglionic neurons. Okay, and we're going to see this. This is going to be taking place in the sympathetic nervous system. So these ganglia of these neurons, they again synapse between. And what we'll see is they also, there are sometimes there are neurons that lie completely in here to help integration. They can many times act as many integrating centers for reflexes. Okay, we don't have to go up to the higher centers, we can reflex through these neurons that lie in the ganglia. So many times sensory input is brought into the ganglia and we can get outgoing autonomic to control, to get this rapid reflex that we need to take place. Okay. So let's look at the anatomical differences between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. What we're going to see is, remember, they both have two neurons. The para, all right, the para, we're going to see where does it originate from. The parasympathetic is going to originate from the cranial, right? It's going to run through many of the cranial nerves, the lower part of the brainstem, okay, the big cranial nerve, the vagus, you can see here the vagus cranial nerve 10 is going to be a big pathway to control many of the targets for the parasympathetic. It's the biggest, 80% of the parasympathetic fibers run through the cranial nerve. Okay, it also runs out of the sacral region. So it's called to originate from, parasympathetic originates from the cranial sacral region, where we're going to see the sympathetic 
is the red here. All right? And it originates from the thoracolumbar, thoracic and lumbar region of the spinal cord. Right? The other difference to is look at the ganglia. The ganglia for the parasympathetic are typically out near the target tissue, where the ganglia for the sympathetic is in the sympathetic chain ganglia that flanks just outside the spinal cord. Right, so this gives a setup of the parasympathetic. Say here's the preganglionic neuron. Right, it's going to run out all the way to ganglia that is near the target tissue. And then the post sympathetic, or sorry, post ganglionic neuron only has to go a short distance. Where in the sympathetic, what do we see happening? We see, all right, the preganglionic neuron only runs from out here out to the sympathetic chain ganglia. So it is short where the postganglionic is long. And this is typical. This is not always the case, but this is a typical setup or anatomical difference between parasympathetic and sympathetic. Okay, what do we have? The parasympathetic originates from the thoracic, thoraco, or sorry, from the craniosacral regions, where the sympathetic originates from the thoracolumbar. Right? The ganglia for the sympathetic is in the sympathetic chain ganglia. Wherefore, for the parasympathetic, they are at ganglias near the target tissue, and that yields for a parasympathetic having a long preganglionic neuron and a short postganglionic, and the sympathetic having a short preganglionic neuron and a long postganglionic neuron. So here's just kind of showing that setup. Uh, what I the poor drawing I did on the previous slide and that the sympathetic has a short preganglionic neuron and a longer postganglionic neuron and with the parasympathetic having the opposite that's what we see here okay. so this shows kind of the arrangement of the sympathetic um, synapsing in that chain ganglia. You'll see the preganglionic neuron leaves the ventral root, comes in, and we'll go through the what's called the white ramus into the chain ganglia. And the key is, is the ganglias sometimes they leave at the same level that they come in of the chain ganglia and sometimes they can go up or they can go down and then leave through the chain ganglia. But you can see our synapsing here in the ganglia. All right. But again, they can go up first and then out or down and then out. They don't have to leave exactly at the level in which they leave the central nervous system. All right. And as we said, times the preganglionic neuron all right can have multiple can diverge can have multiple collaterals and so we can get this one preganglionic neuron from the sympathetic can then go and innervate multiple neurons and what this allows for the sympathetic to do is called mass activation. By activating one neuron, we can have many neurons activated very quickly. It's kind of like fight or flight. When you get scared, boom. It's not like, oh, I'm getting scared. It's bam. It's this real big jolt. 
and that's because we're able to diverge. These pregangliotics can diverge, and we can get mass activation of the systems that are controlled by these divergent pregangliotic neurons. Now, the parasympathetic, we saw leaves cranial sacral, and you know there are multiple cranial nerves in which there are parasympathetic fibers, but the one I really want you to truly know is the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is going to carry about 80% of the parasympathetic tracts. Okay, it's going to go to the head, the neck, and most of the internal organs are covered by the parasympathetic fibers that run through the vagus nerve. Okay, so much of the parasympathetic control over the internal organs of the bodies is ran through the vagus nerve. Okay, cranial nerve number 10. So we looked at the anatomical differences between the two systems, between the sympathetic and parasympathetic. So now let's look at the chemical signals. And we'll see there's some similarities, but there are also differences uh, between both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Uh, where we're going to see the similarities is... The neurotransmitter and the receptor, the neurotransmitter from the preganglionic neuron to the postganglionic neuron is for both sympathetic and parasympathetic is going to be acetylcholine. Also, the neurotransmitter on the post or the on the postganglionic neuron is going to be the nicotinic receptor. If you remember a nicotinic receptor, it allows sodium in and allows for depolarization. So this is always going to have an excitatory effect. There's always going to be an excitatory effect between the pre and the post ganglionic when we're using acetylcholine and the nicotinic receptor. And you can see this is similar between both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. All right. Now for the sympathetic at the neurotransmitter that is released by the postganglionic neuron to the target tissue, most of them are going to secrete norepinephrine. All right, and norepinephrine is going to act on what's called an adrenergic receptor. All right. And if you remember from our cell signaling days, the response at the target tissue is always going to come from what receptor is there. And what we're going to see, there are multiple subtypes of adrenergic receptors that norepinephrine can bind to. Depending on which of the receptors is on the target tissue depends on what's going to happen at the target tissue. So we can have an excitatory effect at the target tissue, or we can have an inhibitory effect okay so keep that in mind the receptor is going to determine what the response is the neurotransmitter can be the same norepinephrine but depending on what subtype depends on what response we get in this target tissue here okay, and that is the same for the parasympathetic the parasympathetic though the postganglionic neuron is going to release acetylcholine all right the target tissue this time it's not going to have a nicotinic it's going to have a muscarinic cholinergic receptor which is a g protein coupled receptor okay i forgot adrenergic receptors are also g protein coupled receptors and there are multiple subtypes of muscarinic receptors so similar to the other what muscarinic receptor that is at the target tissue depends on what response is going to be there, whether it's excitatory or inhibitory. Okay, the receptor determines the response at the target tissue. Okay, so from pre to post ganglionic, it is the same between the sympathetic and parasympathetic for neurotransmitter and receptor, but where we get the differences lies between the post ganglionic to the target tissue between the two systems.
So as we said, most of the postganglionic neurons for the sympathetic nervous system release norepinephrine, um, but there's always special cases and some uh, release are cholinergic and release acetylcholine onto muscarinic receptors. Example of this is those that sympathetic fibers that speak or talk to the sweat glands, they release acetylcholine. Okay, so not always the case, but the majority of those neurons, those postganglionic sympathetic neurons are going to release norepinephrine onto an adrenergic receptor. Okay, here's the general rundown. Here's a acetylcholine across the board here, and the and it's going to all act on. There are going to be nicotinic receptors on these postganglionic neurons, and you can see acetylcholine getting released by the parasympathetic postganglionic neuron and norepinephrine. And you see here is an example of some of the different subtypes of the adrenergic receptors and some of the effects here. All right, so let's first look at signaling through the cholinergic receptors. Okay, we've already seen the nicotinic. Again, this is going to be for both on the postganglionic neuron for both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And as you see, the big bulk of the influx when bound to acetylcholine, the nicotinic is going to allow sodium in to get depolarization. And depolarization, what does that give this? That gives us an excitation of that postganglionic neuron. We're going to allow sodium in. We're going to get depolarization, enough depolarization, and we get firing of that postganglionic neuron. So this is always going to be excitatory. Okay. For the parasympathetic, the postganglionic neuron does release acetylcholine, and so there are cholinergic receptors, but in this case, there are the muscarinic receptors, and the muscarinic receptors are G protein. So we can get varying effects depending on what different, what subtype of muscarinic receptor is there. Some of our muscarinic receptors, when bound, will give us inhibition at the target tissues, and some will give us uh, excitatory effects. You can see for this muscarinic receptor binding acetylcholine, right? It is a G protein. Activation of the G protein will open up potassium channels. Potassium starts leaving, and what's that give us? A hyperpolarization. Hyperpolarization causes inhibition in the neuron. So there we get inhibition. An example of this is a muscarinic receptor that is at the heart, the cells that control the heart rate, and if we inhibit those cells, it'll produce a slower heart rate. Okay. A excitatory muscarinic receptor, you can see you know, binding here, closes potassium channels and opens up sodium or calcium channels, and that would result in Depolarization. Depolarization results in excitation. Okay. And you see excitation in this case. Parasympathetic would excite the smooth muscles of the digestive tract. All right. So this is how you see we get these varying effects. Depending on the receptor subtype depends on what effect we get at the target tissue. And the heart muscles or the cells that control the heart rate binding to a muscarinic receptor slows it down, gives us an ambition, where binding of a muscarinic receptor, the subtype there, gives us excitation and gives us increased contraction of the smooth muscles in the digestive tract. Okay, so again, receptor depend, or determines what effect's going to happen at the target tissue. So looking at the cholinergic uh, receptors here, um, we'll see Skeletal muscle we'll see is nicotinic, but we've seen that nicotinic is for at the autonomic ganglia between the pre and postsynaptic neurons for both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And what's that going to allow? It's going to allow 
sodium ions move in and we get depolarization okay cause an activation what we looked at now muscarinic that's strictly um, not strictly but predominantly parasympathetic nervous system and here's where you can see the difference you can see there are these are different subtypes of muscarinic m3 m5 and m2 down here and here is where you're seeing that differing effect the the neurotransmitter is the same both for these muscarinic and this muscarinic the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine but you can see the m3 m5 what are we going to get depolarization right and we're going to get activation of the smooth muscle or gland smooth muscle being the digestive tract would have the m3 m5 and for the m2 you can see we get the opposite effect we get inhibition we get hyperpolarization okay this is going to slow the rate of the heart so you can see having the same neurotransmitter but different receptors we're getting different effects at the tissues so the response by the target tissue or target cells is determined by the receptor subtype that is there now let's look at the receptors that are going to be activated by the sympathetic nervous system at the target tissue we got norepinephrine and epinephrine are both neurotransmitters for the sympathetic nervous system chiefly we get norepinephrine but we'll have see epinephrine getting released by the adrenal medulla to respond on tissue and these are both g protein coupled receptors you can see an alpha 1 adrenergic subtype and a beta adrenergic subtype you see the alpha here alpha can bind both norepinephrine and epinephrine depending on which is more prevalent and you can see the response it is a g protein couple receptor we're signaling through ip3 and dag in this case but what are we getting we're getting response we're getting contraction of the smooth muscle um, and we get vasoconstriction say if we were at the blood vessel whereas if we activate a beta adrenergic receptor what's the response we get smooth muscle relaxation we get vaso dilation so depending again on what receptor is there what subtype of receptor depends on what the response is going to be at the target tissue so here's where we can kind of see the differing responses with the differing receptors out there we got the alpha ones and the beta 1 beta 2 adrenergic receptors and remember at certain tissues the sympathetic wants to activate or increase the activity whereas other tissues it wants to decrease the activity so something as our heart what do we want to do we want to increase our heart rate what's that going to do the beta 1 is going to increase heart rate let's look at for our arterioles all right alpha 1 is going to cause constriction constriction meaning we're shunting the blood supply away from these organs and in this case for the skin and visceral vessels we want to when we're fight or flight we're running we don't need to have our blood going to our skin and to our internal organs we need our blood going to the blood or to the skeletal muscles okay we also have alpha 1 on skeletal muscles that causes constriction right but that's not what we want we want dilation and that's in case where there is also beta 2 receptors on the arterioles for skeletal muscle and what do you see happening that epinephrine from our sympathetic is going to cause dilation so here's where we get that different response we get constriction here but we get vasodilation at the skeletal muscles okay so again the the um receptor subtype is going to determine what the action is beta 2 going to cause relaxation allow those airways to open we also want that because we want to be able to get in more oxygen to fuel our muscles and then alpha 1 at the stomach is going to slow down the passage of food remember this is the opposite of rest and digest so that makes sense in that when we activate the alpha 
it's going to decrease the activity of the stomach and intestines. Okay, so here again, I want to just point out the receptor subtype is going to determine what action is going or what response is going to take place at the target tissue. So we've seen the neurotransmitter and we've seen the effect of the receptors. Let's see how we get this neurotransmitter to be released. We've seen in the neuron, right, the synapse or the axon terminal comes in and there's a location where there are these receptors. This is going to differ a bit in the autonomic in where the receptors on the target tissues are located not in one distinct region but around the whole tissue, the cells. Okay, and so that means we have to have a differing way to release. We can't release in one location to activate all these receptors. We have to release along the way. And that's where we get these, what's French terms, synapse in pulsant. All right, you can see these varicosity, these bulges along the axon for this sympathetic neuron. And so what's happening is we have what this neural effector junction and the fact that we have neurotransmitter released along these varicosities. So not one distinct location, but along the way through the axon so we can activate receptors that are located throughout that tissue. Okay, so we got varicosities are these swollen areas, regions on the axon that contain those neurotransmitters that are sitting in vesicles. Okay, the release is going to be very similar in that we're going to get action potential coming down, causing calcium to move in, voltage-gated calcium channels to open, and that's going to elicit the uh, exocytosis of the neurotransmitters here at the viscosities. So let's look at this uh, release of neurotransmitter from this varicosity. You can, you'll see it's very similar to what we see at the axon terminal. It's just this will be happening on these varicosities all the way down the axon on these bulges. All right, so the axon coming in this direction, axon, or sorry, not axon, action potential is coming in. And here we have our voltage-gated calcium channels, just like we saw at the synapse or at the axon terminal that opens up these calcium channels. Calcium rushes in. Calcium is going to activate those snare proteins, and we get okay, binding and release of neurotransmitter. Okay. In this case, we're out here. We're not in this little distinct little synapse, so this is all interstitial fluid. So we get our response binding and then the neurotransmitter will diffuse away. Okay, so very similar. Just recognize that this is going to happen multiple times down these axons because there are multiple varicosities in which the neurotransmitter is going to be released. Let's look at a specialized case of release of neurotransmitter in the case of the sympathetic nervous system. We've already seen endocrine, we've seen the adrenal cortex, that's where we get our cortisol, our aldosterone, that is regular old, and we're talking cortex of the adrenal gland, we're talking this outer portion, that is regular old endocrine tissue. All right, the medulla though, the smaller core, is actually of neuro tissue. This is actually going to be modified post ganglionic sympathetic cells. Okay, it's from neuro, from ectoderm origin, origin, sorry. Okay, and they have these what's called chromaffin cells. These chromaffin cells are these modified post ganglionic sympathetic neurons and what uh, their job is to is they'll there will be a preganglionic neuron coming in and talking to one of these chromaffin cells and the, causing the chromaffin cells to release the epinephrine so that is where we're going to get our epinephrine release that's where you get that jolt 
of epinephrine is the activation of the chromaffin cells here to secrete that epinephrine out into the blood. Here's a more better look at it. Here's the, so in this case, now a little bit different, a little bit different setup for parasympathetic because typically we use the, where do we use the synapse? We synapse in that sympathetic chain ganglia. We're here, we're leaving the, and headed all the way out to the adrenal gland before we synapse with the postganglionic cell. In this case, the postganglionic cell is this chromaffin cell, which is a modified neuron, and it's going to release epinephrine. We're going to release a norohormone because we're releasing epinephrine into the bloodstream. Okay. So where does most of this, much of the control for this autonomic response, how do we operate or control the parasympathetic and sympathetic uh, nervous systems is they are housed in these lower regions of the brain, right? It's under unconscious thought, so we're not up here in the cortex where we get conscious thought, but in these lower portions, these real housekeeping areas of the brain that are going to help control all these things that keep us, our bodies homeostatic. And those are going to be housed in the hypothalamus, pons, and medulla. Okay, all this housekeeping stuff is housed in these lower regions of the brain. So this housekeeping will take place via autonomic reflexes. All right, we have information coming in, sensory information, hypothalamic. Uh, visceral sensory information coming into the pons medulla into those control regions of the brain and those control control regions can then send out through autonomic response we'll see this is also the autonomic is also tied closely with the endocrine system and that these control regions also influence endocrine response okay well we get this Information, sensory information, hypothalamus, visceral information, and we can get our response. These regions can control it. All right, what we'll also see is, yes, this autonomic is involuntary. We don't have control. It is just happening without our knowledge. But there is some of our conscious thought that does influence our autonomic nervous system. Stuff like stress and so forth will activate our limbic systems or cerebral cortex. And there is some interplay in how these control regions will respond, what autonomic response will be sent out and so forth. So there is an interplay between the conscious control. So emotions such as stress can influence what output is going out through these control regions. So the autonomic is going to have two different types of control uh, to keep homeostasis. And it depends on whether the tissues are innervated by both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, where some tissues are, such as the, the heart muscle, or not the heart muscles, the heart cells that maintain the heart rate, they'll be innervated by both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. All right, and so that will be said to be under antagonistic control okay when the tissues have both and this gives you some fine-tuning of control of the tissue and and usually one's dominant the other one is dampened down or the opposite way they are antagonistic in control sympathetic is going to increase the heart rate where parasympathetic is going to decrease the heart rate there are tissues that are solely just innervated by the sympathetic nervous system all right and so this will be controlled by what we call a tonic control and it will be how much so when the sympathetic nervous system is secreting norepinephrine to the blood vessels or the arterioles we're going to get constriction if there's less release of neurotransmitter then the, vest, the uh, arterioles will vasodilate, open up. Okay, so that's under con tonic control. We're just innervated by the sympathetic solely.
Okay, so there's temp uh, tissues that are tonic control, but most are typically for the autonomic are under antagonistic. We'll have innervation by both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. All right, so here's just a visual. Here's what we're talking about with the heart muscles. Okay, in this is antagonistic in when what do we have here the parasympathetic is active or sorry the sympathetic is active okay parasympathetic stamp and down heart rate is fairly quick and you see when the parasympathetic is activated and the sympathetic is dampened down you can see the heart rate is the the distance between beats is stretched out so the heart rate is decrease. So this is antagonistic control. Now here's an example of tonic control in that these blood vessels or arterioles are, are regulated or innervated solely by the sympathetic nervous system. So here's just normal firing rate, just called basal firing rate of the neuron. All right, we get a fairly wide open vessel, All right? But now with increased firing, higher frequency of action potential, more neurotransmitters being released. Now we're going to activate those receptors more, and we're going to get constriction of the vessel. Now compared to basal rate, the rate is slow down the frequency of action potential is decreased now there is less neurotransmitter being released and then we see here and what happens the muscles can relax and they will dilate okay so we get tonic control just solely innervation by the sympathetic nervous system so from these tables you can see that most tissues are under antagonistic control. We're getting both a parasympathetic response and a sympathetic response. I'll put the red down there. Okay, where they're working in opposite antagonistic direction of each other. Okay. Arterials, you can see there is no parasympathetic response. So here we see solely the response of the sympathetic nervous system. It's going to cause constriction or dilate depending on what receptor is there. Okay, the norepinephrine is going to activate the alpha 1 constricting, but remember that epinephrine that would be secreted out by that adrenal medulla will actually act on there and will get vasodilation. So your muscle, your skeletal muscles have beta 2 because we want those activated by the sympathetic. We want the dilation to the skeletal muscles to take place when the sympathetic is activated. See some others, no parasympathetic, so the adrenal medulla, we already saw that case. Uh, the kidneys with a release of renin, we'll discuss later on when we get to urinary. Adipose, sweat glands, and some of the lymphoid tissue are just solely under tonic control signaling by the sympathetic nervous system only. So here's just kind of a rundown of the comparisons of what we've been talking about through this lecture and the differences between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic and their anatomical arrangements and the chemical signaling that takes place between them. So this gives you a good rundown of uh, what we looked at and a good kind of cheat sheet for studying um, these differences to compare the two systems. All right. Now, I know we said we're going to focus mainly on the autonomic pathways, but we said briefly we'll touch on the somatic motor pathway. All right. So here we're going to look at Kind of the difference between the two. We saw with our autonomics, we have that two neuron pathway. We have the preganglionic and the postganglionic, and we talked the neurotransmitters and what the target tissues are 
for our somatic it is going to have from the central nervous system there's just going to be one large motor neuron or long motor neuron that is going to go out to the skeletal muscle and you can see at the skeletal muscle we will have acetylcholine and the muscle will have the nicotinic receptor so we're going to get depolarization of the skeletal muscle when the somatic motor neuron is talking to the skeletal muscle this forms what we call the neuromuscular junction and since we're going to be moving in to muscle this is the setup we got the motor neuron coming in talking releasing acetylcholine to skeletal muscle and we get depolarization of the skeletal muscle okay. looking at comparisons between the autonomic right we've seen what's the we got one versus two neurons in the pathways we got at the target tissue we got acetylcholine with nicotinic and for the autonomic depending on which system here's this parasympathetic or for the sympathetic okay and the target tissues solely skeletal muscle for somatic and autonomic smooth muscle cardiac and so forth okay we'll see the effect of the neurotransmitter at, is excitatory only we're always going to elicit contraction of the muscle it's always going to be excitatory depolarization whereas with the autonomic it can be excitatory inhibitory so we're utilizing those g protein couple receptors with the adrenergic and the cholinergic muscarinic receptors okay and so that's the major differences between the two all right most of this focus on autonomic we're going to be getting into skeletal muscles so it's good to have a rundown of the somatic motor system because we will be seeing that acetylcholine and nicotinic activating our skeletal muscles to get us to get contraction of the muscle so remember the difference between the autonomic and the somatic is the somatic has only one neuron that's going out to the muscle it's speaking to the skeletal muscle so where do these uh, neurons originate from they're going to originate in the spinal cord okay the ventral horn of the spinal cord and going to travel all the way out to the muscle it's talking to this could be a muscle in the big toe therefore these axons of these neurons can be very long in length okay let me get my big head out of the way all right and you can see here are the somatomotic look at that. this is where they originate from from the ventral horn and go out and they'll go all the way out to the skeletal muscle you can see the other that we just discussed the afferent ones originate here in the lateral horns okay those would be the sympathetic neurons originating there okay but this neuron here is going to travel all the way out to whatever muscle uh, it's talking to all right and when it reaches there it forms the synapse with the muscle the neuro called the neuromuscular junction okay you can see it synapses in multiple locations with this muscle but underneath where we get the synapse all right where that axon terminal talks to the muscle fibers you can see there is a specialized arrangement these indentions here and there is your nicotinic acetylcholine receptors so you got your acetylcholine being released by the motor neuron and then it's being released onto the nicotinic receptors here so here is that arrangement that neuromuscular junction and so we have synapses we have the neuron coming into an axon terminal okay different from the autonomic where we had those bulges with varicosity where we're getting neurotransmitter being released in multiple locations here this neurotransmitter is going to get released here because this is where all 
these nicotinic receptors reside all right at the neuromuscular junction that's the synapse between the motor neuron and the muscle fiber the skeletal muscle all right but same setup and action potential is running down that cues our voltage gated calcium channels to open calcium rushes in and then cues the release of that acetylcholine acetylcholine is going to go bind to the receptor here all right our nicotinic receptor and that's going to allow sodium and potassium to pass through more sodium coming in and therefore we get our depolar if we were measuring we get our depolarization of the muscle fiber muscle fiber similar to uh, skeletal muscle in that we're going to be able to conduct action potentials we're going to get it excited and then it's going to be able to conduct action potential okay and once acetylcholine remember we have that acetylcholinesterase that's that enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine into acetyl and choline right because we don't want this muscle to be we want to be able to contract the muscle and then relax it all right if we didn't get rid of the signal we would have constant contraction of the muscle and we don't want that all right so that'll end us for the autonomic and skeletal or somatic motor system the brief part that we did a somatic but uh, this will be the next exam we'll have the nervous system the sensory nervous system and the autonomic nervous system All right that is it